Okay, let me get started with a few rules for today. Um, we've got about half of our participants um, on board and folks are coming in by the second. So um, we will be recording this session. Um, if you have uh, concerns about the recording, just um, you can use the, um, just your name on the screen. Um, also, please keep your um, mics muted during our presentation. Um, introduce yourselves in the chat. And then after our presentation, um, we will have time for some questions. So I'll be monitoring the chat and providing um, our keynote with some questions that um, you may be presenting. So feel free to um, ask some questions in the chat and we'll have some time to answer questions. Um, so with that, um, it's 11.02. I think we need to get started. We've got quite a few participants here and welcome everyone. Um, again, seeing lots of diversity in the chat. Um, many Bay Area folks, um, teachers and current teachers and future teachers and um, current students all over the Bay Area. And we also want to warmly welcome our uh, friends from Southern California, Central California, Northern California, and out of state. I've seen a few folks from out of state. So welcome. Um, I'd like to introduce um, our keynote. He's from uh, USF. He's going to be giving um, <laughs> an introduction. You'll be learning a lot about him. Um, I'm going to introduce him as Cam. He's got that in his um, apostrophe there. And we're very happy to have USF represented here um, as our keynote. And I know his beginning slides will um, allow you to get to know him better. So welcome to Teach for the Bay. And thank you so much for being our keynote. And I'm going to mute myself and you can take it away. Welcome, Cam. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for um, having me. I am incredibly honored to be a part of um, the Teach for the Bay conference and uh, conversation. Um, thank you so much, um, Kathleen or Kathy uh, White uh, for considering me to be a part of this. I am um, honored that this is the second invitation you extended to me which says that uh, despite my first presentation, you, you still invited me back. So thank you for that. Um, I, I haven't met Tracy Burt, I don't think personally, but thank you for coordinating this conference. And um, of course, I wanna shout out and salute and embrace virtually my uh, uh, dear friend. I don't know if we're, she knows we're dear friends, but I consider her my dear friend, Jerrica Coffey, who I first met in 2008, um, on a panel for the Te Teachers for Social Justice Conference. And uh, hi, Bettine. <laughs> and someone who I consider uh, an incredible educator, uh, organizer, activist, and, and human being. And so, and, and actually who helped me think through the title of this presentation when I first started developing it early on. Um, so, uh, and all of you for being here, thank you. I am truly humbled by it all. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I imagine somebody will give me uh, time warnings. So the um, title of this presentation is based on some uh, research I've been doing in schools as a teacher researcher uh, for the past decade or so. Um, uh, through my work with Jeff Duncan Andrade and Sean Jennerite who started turning to the health sciences to inform our research on urban education and in my research on critical pedagogy or you know, also known as sort of socially transformative teaching. It is informed uh, mostly uh, by this notion of the social indicators of health. And the social indicators of health um, is similar to the social indicators of academics. The social indicators of academics will tell us that if you um, identify a demographic of a community, the racial demographic, the class demographic, the, um, and if you look at that research done in SFUSD and other districts throughout the country, even um, gender identity uh, demographics, we can predict the uh, academic achievement of a school. 
And what that tells us essentially is that school, uh, it pushes back on this narrative that schools are failing. Because if we can predict the academic achievement of a school based on its demographic, then it's not failing. It's, schools are actually highly successful at what they've been designed to do. Right, so it's actually a system imbalance. And so similarly, uh, if we apply the social indicators uh, of social indicator, we, we extend that to the social indicators of health, what we know is that if you tell us a demographic of a community, the race, class, gender, um, sexual orientation, probably religion and other uh, markers of social identity, then we, can, um, we know that those who are multiply marginalized are disproportionately exposed to um, the big four stress-related diseases, which is type two diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and, and heart disease. And so um, what we found, what um, research, what we have found from the research is that um, a, a great mediating, I guess, um, type of thought against stress is hope. Hope has proven to decrease the exposure and um, attacks of the big four diseases. And so when we think about socially transformative teaching, when you think about culturally relevant, culturally sustaining, um, you know, critically conscious teaching that is informed by the health sciences and the social indicators of health, I, I wanna think about making sure that we have teaching that t helps young people, children, you know, adolescents go from coping, not coping, or maladaptively coping to the stress of everyday life, to um, hoping, which uh, Leonard Syme, an epi social epi epidemiologist at Cal Berkeley refers to as uh, developing a sense of control over your life. Hope as developing a sense of control over your life. So developing a sense of control over your life helps decrease the stress that um, without the resources to cope too often leads to the big four stress related diseases. And so the way I believe we um, should do this as educators or future educators or school leaders is to develop a program that allows us as teachers to teach students to thrive through their social trauma, not ignore, not um, simply survive, but to thrive through their social trauma. And this will be a little bit clearer as I continue this uh, presentation. And so what I essentially hope to do today is just simply provide an opportunity for us to reflect on the teaching or pedagogical or psychological insights that will help us more effectively um, serve the needs of communities that we are teaching in. Right. Hopefully this health science informed um, approach to socially transformative teaching will help us think about ways to generate new practices, to think about ways to radically heal from the um, structural harm of, social, of intersecting social inequity, and maybe even um, mobilize for systemic change. And I will do my best to, to keep us engaged in, uh, with that purpose and um, in mind. Uh, and I'm going to do that um, first with my uh, critical self-reflection. And I share this narrative with you, not to sort of prop myself up as this like model that um, should be followed in order to engage in socially transformative teaching wherever you're at. Not as a model, but as a mirror. And so as I tell my story, I hope to um, have you reflect on your own story so that as I'm narrating through my trajectory, that you're thinking about your parallel trajectory um, that has brought you here today as well. And um, so, yes, I am a teacher educator, a teacher of teachers at the University of San Francisco. I am even a department chair, which means I'm control, in control of our de departmental budget. I don't know who decided to give me that authority, um, especially if you see how my you know, personal budget looks. But um, I wasn't always this educated. This is the last time I was in the Philippines, 1980. I, I was six years old at the time. I'm 47, 46 now, I, something like that. Um, 
And so um, my father, who's on the left side of this picture, is from the north side of the Philippines, from a place called Pangasinan, Luzon. And my mother on the right side of this image is from the south side of the Philippines, from a place called uh, Surigao, Mindanao. And uh, shortly before I was born, they both migrated to the United States in search of, quote unquote, a, a better life. And shortly after this picture, I uh, began to um, observe as my parents started to realize that they were being alienated from the so-called American dream that they migrated to the uh, United States for. And I would watch as this realization turned into sadness uh, morph into anger and evolve into rage, which I internalized. And as early as um, second grade, as a seven-year-old, I would sit in class, watch my teachers teach, asking myself um, in, in a seven-year-old kind of way, what does this have to do with me? And so I earned poor grades. And you'll see here that um, 28 out of 48 of my um, grades at, at seven years old, was below a C, right? More than 50% of my grades were below a C. And I, I think I earned or was assigned poor grades, not because I was unintelligent. I believe in, in, reflect, in reflecting back that I earned poor grades because my teachers lacked the personal connection, the cultural competence, and the um, critical ability to, um, to make their uh, social irrelevance of their cultural miseducation useful for my everyday life as a, a child of um, immigrants from the Philippines. And so um, I re not only internalized this rage, which led to these grades, but then I started to um, reproduce this rage when I was initiated into my neighborhood gang. And so this is an image of me at a, a temple graffiti, um, 1988. Uh, and you know that there was a significant album that came out at the time that because um, schooling was so culturally irrelevant to me that I found solace in the words of um, young black men who were the voice of gang culture in Los Angeles. Type in the chat if you know what that album was. And so I can't, I'm not seeing the chat, but the album was Straight Outta Compton, right, by a group called uh, NWA. And you can see that I was in my sort of Southeast Asian um, pose with my Fila hat on, acting like a wannabe Filipino Easy E. And you can see from the drippings on the spray paint on the wall that I wasn't actually very artistically talented. And so um, in 1989, uh, I was a, a 10th grader at a school called Los Angeles High School, and some of my homies asked me to go hit up these dudes who look like and probably experienced life just like us as young Filipino men in, in um, mid city Los Angeles. And so I hit them up, hit them up, was asking what gang they were from. I asked them what gang they were from. They claimed the neighborhood that we constructed as rivals to us. I, I punched one of the people and it became a big old fight at LA High. And um, that was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving in 1989. The Monday after Thanksgiving, they brought me in, uh, my principal, my counselor, the dean of students, and my mother and I, the principal. I was already on academic probation because as a junior high school student, my uh, grades were finalized with, two, uh, with a month left of school. And so I continued that academic probation and they pulled up my report card and they, they saw my grades and decided that the principal says that um, you're not made for a school like LA High. I was like, cool. So I didn't attend school for, uh, for a while. And I spent most of my time with my homies who, you know, also resisted the, um, the, the demands of mainstream schooling. And you can see that we were drinking Budweiser's at 16 years old, not simply to self-medicate from the stresses of um, social oppression. We were drinking Budweiser's because we didn't have access to craft beer at the time. If we were ditching school today, we might have been drinking IPAs. Um, so anyway, I, I didn't... Um, Spent most of my time with my homies. And then finally, in 92, three years later, I earned my equivalency. And from there, deep down inside, at least subconsciously, I, I thought I still wanted to um, integrate into, the main, into mainstream society. And so I tried my hand at community college. You see, uh, in 92, I started. And if you look at my grades, if, if, if they didn't have withdrawals at uh, the college level, I probably would have a lot of fails. Similar to my second grade 
grades and my high school grades and my middle and my junior high school grades. And so I continued at community college and you see from 92, 94. Now you see here 94, um, similar grades through 95, similar grades. And then 96, um, summer of 96, uh, I, I got pulled over on the 110 freeway north. I was passing Imperial. The police told me to slow down but my short-term memory kicked in. So I sped up as they were exiting on Century. They pulled me over on Manchester. They found some things that are legal today, uh, thriving as a, as a business if you're an entrepreneur, but was illegal back then. And so they took me to, uh, they impounded my car, spent time uh, in Men's Central Prison for, for 28 days. And uh, I was terrified my first few days because they had this thing called a uh, green light on Asians, which was uh, essentially open season for the Asian gangs, Lao Asian gangs, the Vietnamese gangs, Filipino gangs, Vietnamese gangs, uh, Chinese gangs, who didn't honor the um, red light on drive-by shootings amongst what we used to call down there as essays, which were Latinx, probably primarily Mexican gangs. And so uh, it was open season in, in, in at least in Southern California jails. And um, I was terrified, but uh, fortunately, the Asians and Pacific Islanders were protected by black folks and the, uh, as at the same time, brown folks protected what they referred to in that space as pecker woods, which were white folks. And um, one of the, and the, and the um, black man who offered me a bunk bed, uh, which is, you know, a way of offering me, I guess, protection, uh, would engage me in, in a lot of dialogue, both about the black market economy and uh, real life and about, um, us as potential agents of change. And one of the early conversations he had with me was about my family's last name. He said, Kamanyan. He said, um, he didn't know what sense to make of that. So he says, um, how about your other family's last name? I said, you know, Dela Cruz. He says, okay. Um, I said, um, Roz. He says, okay. He goes, how about some Latinx people? That's not how he said it. And so what are some Latinx people's last names, right? Probably, you know, Garcia. Aguilar, Sanchez, I said, you know, he says, okay. He says, how about some black folks? What's some black people's last name? Type it in the chat. What's some black folks last names? Probably uh, White, Perkins. Um, I, I, it could be a number of things, right? And then he says, okay, how about some white folks? What are their last names? Williams, um, you know, all types of things. He says, okay. What do we all have in common? common? And then I say, uh, I have no idea, but I have to listen to him because he was buff. And um, not only that, but he didn't see my anger and my rage and my sensibilities as a deficit. In fact, he saw that as an asset, something to build off of. Something, he wanted to channel my rage against the social system that despised our humanity. And so he, um, offered me the answer. He says, the one thing we have in common is that we all have European last names. And then he further clarified that we have European last names because we've been Euro conquered by European civilization. Still had no idea what he meant. One of the other conversations we had is when he asked me to look around the dormitory and tell him what I saw. I, I told him, I said, they look like they gang bang this set. They look like they gang bang this set. They look like they deal this. They look like they are thieves. They look, whatever. He said that I wasn't looking close enough because if I was looking close enough, then we would see that well, we are doing exactly what the system of social inequality, social inequity, social oppression wants us to do. We are doing exactly what the system wants us to do. I still had no idea what he was talking about. Finally, he transferred me into a four bed cell seven days later. There were six of us, so I slept on the concrete floor and that night, I started doing some reflection. My first fight in kindergarten, all the subsequent fights years to come, uh, what uh, brought me to the neighborhood gang. And I said to myself upon that reflection that that was me doing exactly what this system wanted me to do. That was me doing exactly as a, a history of colonization, um, of, of Western domination expected me to do. And I decided uh, around that moment that if I could uh, not catch a felony, that I would be the type of teacher that I would have uh, I wished I had prior to second grade, that I would be the type of teacher I wish I had prior to being pushed out of school. And um, years later, I became, and so I had that realization. Now, summer 96, if you see that right here, I failed statistics, fall of 96, I failed 
I don't know. I feel I, I didn't fail, but you'll know that I never in my life, even in junior high school, high school, I never passed pre-algebra. I never passed algebra. I never passed geometry. And I convinced my community college counselor to put me in statistics and I fought my way through it. I did what I had to do to get a B. And finally in 98, I started in 92, finally in 98, six years later, I, I met my IGETC and I finally transferred to Cal State LA. I graduated from Cal State LA one year later. So it took me six and a half years to finish community college when my purpose was to integrate myself back into mainstream society. I finished my junior and senior year at Cal State LA in, in a year and a half when my purpose became not to simply teach so I can help students conform to a system that despises their humanity. I finished in a year and a half in an accelerated rate when my purpose became to help teach young people to transform this system that despises their humanity. And so I finally became that teacher. I taught at Crenshaw High School in Los Angeles for eight years. I taught at uh, an OUSD um, as a volunteer teacher while being a professor at the University of San Francisco for, um, for seven years. And um, now, you know, you know, we built a uh, urban ed and social justice program at USF where we have essentially 75% teachers of color um, for a profession that is roughly 86% white, mostly uh, white women. And I'm not saying like white teachers and white women are, you know, naturally bad. And because we have white allies and white co-conspirators in our program who are allies and who are critically conscious, so they serve a different purpose than teaching students of color to conform to the system. And so uh, essentially this, my work as a teacher, my work as an educator, my work as a teacher of teachers is, informed by the foundation taught to me by the um, OG in jail. What brings me to you today, what informs my scholarship to this day was taught to me in a place I wasn't supposed to learn by a person I wasn't supposed to learn from. And um, that is essentially um, a story I tell as a person who studied at the community college who um, is hoping you are in touch with your story so that you're clearer with your purpose, um, whether you're already a teacher, a school leader, a university student, or a community college student, to know that your experience as a young person, wherever you, you study or studied or um, grew up in life, that the lessons from you critically reflecting on the ways you were underserved as a young person could help inform the ways you want to serve young people more effectively as a teacher in, in schools. And so now transitioning back to, to my um, presentation around coping and hoping teaching students to thrive through social trauma. There was an article written um, about four years ago after someone interviewed Jeff Duncan Andrade and they titled the article, I believe something to the effect of um, trauma, the new hood disease. And the problem with that is that with this um, rise of trauma-informed um, research and education, that people are beginning to use it to pathologize um, multiply marginalized people as though we're sort of naturally mentally um, harmed, systemically harmed and, and mentally ill. But what we have to understand is that, this, that even if we experience social trauma or toxic stress, that it's not inherent to uh, multiply marginalized people. This harm is systemic, it's historic, it's history present in the moment without the resources to cope with the social trauma that this intersecting system of social oppression, oppression imposes on us. And two, that even if we have intergenerational social traumas, that at the same time that uh, marginalized, multiply marginalized people have legacies of intergenerational wisdom that serve as protective elements to resist social toxicities. And that we have to tap into that history of community cultural wealth, that history of problem posing social resistance as um, the foundation for how we even teach young folks to learn how to transform the um, 
social oppression that we experience in this uh, in U.S. society. And so, uh, and even when young people might experience psychological trauma, social trauma, stress, toxic stress, or even complex traumas, that those that's still not licensed for low expectations. That the fact that young people navigate uh, material conditions that um, would cripple so many of the adults teaching them is evidence of their ability to survive. And it's that ability to survive, that evidence of resilience that we want to leverage um, as opportunities to learn, communicating to them that our ancestors, that their elders have sacrificed, put in work, so that because they believe in our ability to create the world we need for ourselves and the descendants to come after us. And, um, and so that's a couple disclaimers around sort of trauma-informed education. It's not licensed for low expectations. There's so much wisdom that we could tap into. And um, because so many people have sacrificed their lives before us, that is why we need to you know, read, write, do math, do science as a way to disrupt the dehumanization of social oppression. And so if we, just to sort of summarize and clarify, this um, social trauma comes as a result of social inequity. And um, the social, inequitable social conditions creates the social toxicity, which then creates the social trauma. So inequitable social conditions is like systemic violence, systemic oppression, systemic harm. Social toxicity is like interpersonal, intercultural, intergroup, intragroup um, harm, which then is internalized and creates social trauma. And so, uh, you know, if you think about uh, the different, um, uh, the current context of, of this pandemic, you know, you think about the ways in which black and brown communities are especially vulnerable to COVID-19 exposure, uh, inequitable, access to healthcare and testing, a history of redlining and, and gentrification, uh, uh, environmental racism, wealth gap, all of these um, systemic inequities um, sort of impose structural harm, which impacts is our, that impacts our mental health, right? And so there's a, a myriad of ways that people cope or not cope or maladaptively cope with these social stressors. And I think it's important that we put them in a position to critically examine these decisions so that they can develop a sense of control or collective control over their lives. And so um, turning then back to um, the social indicators of health or health science research, it tells us, if we look at the work of Jill Tucker, who writes for the San Francisco Gate, she did a study with Nadine Burke Harris, who was the first Cal um, Surgeon General for the state of California, pediatrician Bayview, Hunters Point, San Francisco. They found early on, about uh, 10 or 11 years ago, that when comparing this you know, their data to data from the Pentagon that um, children in, in urban communities, for them, Bayview Hunters Point, showed symptoms of PTSD at a rate um, two times greater than soldiers returning from war, right? So imagine that. So their, their data from Bayview Hunters Point and sort of um, projected out to other urban communities say that children in, in um, targeted, economically targeted communities show intense feelings of distress, uh, especially when in, uh, reminded of a tragic event. They, they show uh, evasive, invasive, upsetting memories um, of a tragedy, flashbacks of, of these tragedies happening again, nightmares, a loss of interest in life and daily activities, feeling emotionally numb um, uh, and detached from other people, a sense of not leading a normal life, two times greater than soldiers returning from war. So then if you um, look at the work of the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, they did a study at Jefferson High School in South Central LA. And what they found was that 92% of their ninth graders showed symptoms of PTSD. And if you compare that to uh, data from, the, um, from I, don't, I, don't, I forgot what the data was from, but the Rand Corporation said that that, was, that meant that students in urban communities like South Central Los Angeles showed symptoms of PTSD more than children in war-torn Iraq. War-torn, not the peripheries of, of Iraq, but war-torn Iraq. And so if you, Think about that. Uh, um, Stanford School of Public Health, the Harvard School of Public Health, they started um, calling this um, not just PTSD, but complex PTSD or complex traumas, right? And so, but I think the naming of that sort of pussyfoots around the reality of it. 
Because if you think about what that might mean, it might, it, what it means is that, let's just say there's a two-year-old who is exposed to or experiencing uh, a, a life-threatening event um, or some type of threat. Without the resources to cope, there's nothing post about it. So they're four now. Witness or experience a, a, a threat, a life-threatening event or, or, you know, no without the resources to cope, there's nothing post about it. Now they're six, now they're eight, now they're 10, now they're 12, now they're 14, now they're 16, now they're 18. And these are students in K-12 schools. And if they haven't gotten the, had the resources to cope between K-12, it's not like you become 18 year adult and all of a sudden your social traumas dissipate, heal without actual healing. And so these children end up in our classrooms, not from co simply complex PTSD, but if we name it in a more accurate language, it's a sort of compound, permanent traumatic stress. And so if you racialize it, if you look at the work of Joy DeGruy Leary, she talks about it as um, in the, Afri in the um, black community as post-traumatic slave syndrome. And then in the Jewish community, they're the ones who was credited with think, um, the term intergenerational trauma. Um, looking at the um, descendants of Holocaust survivors, similar to you know, descendants of indigenous people who experienced genocide, <clears throat> um, descendants of uh, enslaved Africans. Um, so we have a sort of, um, inner, you know, which impacts what they call the epigenetics, which you know, alters our DNA, DNA when there's um, intergenerational trauma passed down from one generation to generation. So you have a, a real race-based, socially based, intergenerational, compounded social trauma with children in our classes and even children in community colleges and even universities and even as teachers who have continued to teach without healing the social traumas that they've experienced. And so um, when, they're, when students who experience this are sitting in our classrooms, it's not that they're simply disengaged. Um, Jerrica, I believe, is a student at USF when um, Herb Cole was there. Herb Cole, Jewish educator, really critical, um, came up with this concept of willed not learning. He says that it's not simply that students are, are disengaged and bored, it's that they have a willed not learning, that they willingly choose not to learn from someone who disrespects their dignity. And that's from a, a social theory, um, educational point of view. From a health science point of view, we can look to the work of Bruce Perry, who wrote a book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. And in chapter two, he says that children aren't simply bored with their teaching, with um, irrelevant teaching, that in addition to that, children in urban communities oftentimes have a hyperactive stress response system that forces them to pay, a fact, pay attention to factors in their life that could cause them more stress. And so think about it this way. Uh, if you think about the hyperactive stress response system, sim similar to a limbic system, similar to an, the amygdala. And the amygdala doesn't know the difference between a real or imagined threat. And so for me, when I got this job in 2008 at the University of San Francisco, I would walk around, first time ever that I used to walk around in a mall, and I would see so many Filipinx uh, men appearing people walking around with their, with their baseball hats, with big t-shirts, with jeans on. And I couldn't quite set, make sense of it at the time, but I would feel my muscles tense up. I would see, feel my hands ball into a fist and in my heart, my heart would race. And in my mind, I would think to myself, I want to inflict pain on this Pinoy. And it wasn't until I started looking at the health sciences that I started realizing that my, my amygdala was, was activated. My fight response was activated because they were a perceived threat based on my history as a gang affiliated Filipino person. And so if that's happening to me as a person who's freshly minted, minted with a PhD, about to get a job as a teacher of teachers at the University of San Francisco, what does that mean for children who don't have the language to name their, their, the, the feelings in their body? Oftentimes they're defenseless. And in their positions of powerlessness, we, so, we socially construct notions of power. And so we start saying things like, oh, he thinks he's tough. He ain't tougher than me. She thinks she's cute. She's not cuter than me, right? They think they're smart. They're not smarter than me. And so we have this sort of um, heightened, triggered stress response system that forces us to pay attention to factors in our life that could cause us more stress and distract us from this culturally irrelevant miseducation 
that teachers oftentimes when complying to schooling tries to instruct teachers, um, students who are multiply marginalized seeking something more um, sustaining and relevant and affirming forms of education. And so as a result, Victor Carrion, a, pa a pediatrician at Sanford says that this trauma is not neutral, right? Her, um, Howard Zinn wrote a book called You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. Similarly, teachers can't be neutral when social oppression impacts young people, some of which experience, some of whom experience social trauma. You can't be neutral in that way. Victor Carrion says trauma when gone unaddressed thrives with avoidance. So you can't be neutral. We are either teaching in a way that helps young people decrease the stress that too oftentimes leads to trauma or social trauma, or we are teaching in a way that compounds the pain that's already there. But not all stress leads to trauma or social trauma or, or psychological trauma or uh, PTSD or even stress or toxic stress. But the exposure to stress and toxic stress oftentimes comes, right? We have a young person, female, um, identified at, or ascribed at birth, walking to school, 16. And um, too often is um, the target of the um, praying male gaze and that gaze will um, increase it, it'll it'll, it'll um, trigger the stress hormone of cortisol and um, there's two things that it could help decrease the development of cortisol three things right therapy two time meaning it takes a lot of time to decrease from that stress because you know if you fight with your uh, parent or your loved one or your friend it takes time to decrease that stress that you experience from that argument. Similarly, you have you experience a gaze. It could be it could be two young people who, because of the streets, have a street gaze, right? Just, you got that grimace from that person across the street. It, it boosts that cortisol. It takes time to decrease, but then you have to show up the first period. You're late to first period, ten minutes because you were having to take a different direction, or you were just kind of distracted, needed to splash water into your face. You show up the first period. Your teacher says you're late. You're always late, right? And that's why your people have problems in school. And they might not say it that explicitly, but that's the suggestion. So that increases, that racial microaggression increases the, the development of cortisol, right? Then you get that sort of, that, that look from across the way. If that's not the homie saying, what's good family? Then it's somebody else looking at you like, you know, who are you? And sometimes we project our feelings of others onto their perception of us. And we think that's a, a negative thing. And that's another development of cortisol. And that's just first period. We go to second period. Whatever happens in the hallways happens in the hallways. Whatever happens in the second period happens, happens in the second period. The third period, we're tired of it. We're late to class. We tell people, you know, this school is whack. These teachers are racist. School is irrelevant. So we get sent to the dean. That increases, so, so on and so forth. All of those shots of cortisol without the, the time to, to heal, that's what leads to stress-related diseases. But the third thing that could help mediate the, the development of cortisol, right? The development of cortisol shuts down, it's a, it shuts down the prefrontal cortex, which is an executive function required for learning. Cortisol has a, th a three hour, if we look at the work of Zaretta Hammond, she talks about the ways in which uh, the development of cortisol um, has a shelf life of three hours. And that's just one shot of cortisol. If you have multiple shots of cortisol, multiple exposures to stressors throughout your day, that's three hours plus three hours plus three hours plus three hours. School's what, six hours, seven hours? Oh, the only thing that could um, offset that, the third thing that could offset that is loving relationships. Because loving relationships develop the chemical of oxytocin. Oxytocin helps balance cortisol and opens up the pre pre prefrontal cortex for learning again. And so that's why sometimes when, when students need a break and they say, you know, teacher, can I go to the bathroom? They go to the bathroom and they walk, they take the long way to the bathroom, don't even have to use the bathroom, take the long way back. But on their way to and from the bathroom, they're saying what's up to their friends, they're saying what's up to their cool teachers, because that's shooting them some oxytocin in their um, cortisol driven life. And so it really um, honors that old adage that teach, students don't care how much their teachers know until they know how much their teachers care.
All right. And so we have to, the foundation of our teaching has to be based on socially caring relationships that develop cortisol, that develop a, a collective sense of community, a collective sense of oxytocin, so that when students come into our classes, it helps immediately decrease the cortisol they might be coming into class with simply by looking at the images on the wall, the smile on their teacher's face, the um, positive association with classmates they've been, they've been able to do unifying, politically unifying work with, the sound of the music coming from the speakers. And so once we have that relationship as the foundation of our learning and our connection, we have to teach you to, students to thrive, not survive, not simply avoid social trauma, but thrive through it, right? And it's like that meme that I used to see on Instagram. It says, we, go, we grow through what we go through. Well, this is um, a concept I got, I, um, I'm, I'm borrowing or citing from the work of Sean Jinwright, who in the book, Black Youth Rising, um, constructed the concept called radical healing. And radical healing um, is informed in part by the work of Virginia O'Leary, who talks about psychological thriving. And for uh, Virginia O'Leary, she says um, that once a person experiences a psychological trauma, which um, I changed to social trauma, um, the first level of functioning is submission. So um, let's just say we experience, um, you know, police, whatever, you know, whether it's exposure or experience, maybe, maybe it could be whatever, even a personal trauma of a, of a divorce or of a breakup or uh, a, a loss. Um, or social trauma in terms of um, you know this this you know income loss of income during a pandemic so on and so forth whatever um, brings us to submission and submission is sort of where we um, don't answer the phone we're not looking at emails we're not responding to text our blinds are closed it's um, it's it's funky and um, stuffy indoors. And um, you know, there's piles of uh, um, uneaten four-day-old pizza on top of one-week-old um, fried chicken and, and rice that's been sitting there for three days, and sort of we, we're just kind of disengaging with the world. And so then the next level of functioning is survival, and survival is when we begrudgingly get out of bed. We slowly make our way to the restroom to prepare ourselves for the day. We uh, make our way out the door um, reluctantly and walk to work or school um, um, unwillingly. Uh, we're tardy and when we're there, we're physically present but mentally uh, elsewhere. And we go through our day like that. And we're just sort of going through the motions slowly, reluctantly. And then you have recovery. Recovery is when we were finally operating at the level you were operating at, functioning at prior to experiencing the trauma or the social trauma. And um, we could think about this uh, similarly to as we do about a, a functioning alcoholic. Functioning alcoholic will wake up on time get ready, show up to work on time, do their job diligently, come home, have their first drink, have their second drink, their third or whatever, and start taking out the unresolved grief in their life out on the people most immediate to them until they fall asleep, wake up, do the same thing the next day. And they're functioning at the level they were functioning at prior to experiencing the pain, but haven't quite healed or radically healed from it. But what we want to teach young people to do is to thrive. And to thrive is when they uh, metaphorically become a bigger person, right? Thriving takes place when uh, we become, um, when we find purpose as a result of critically examining our past pain. 
we find strength as a result of critically making sense of past struggle. It is, let's just say, a, a, sur a survivor who, uh, rather than working with other survivors because that type of altruism is too close to home, decides that she wants to help students who don't have access to quality education learn math and science so that they can be more prepared for university eligibility and, and increasing um, people's access to university education helps disrupt the inequitable um, pipeline for black and brown students in uh, lower resource and economically targeted spaces. And so um, that person is thriving because they have joined with others to help to transform the social oppression that led to their trauma in the first place. And that is thriving. We want to, we want to measure, we want to assess young people, assess like, you know, grade them on, right? Evaluate their learning. We want to evaluate them on the critical thinking, the academic skills, the social compassion, the self-compassion, and the leadership skills necessary to transform unjust social conditions. That is teaching young people to thrive through social trauma. In order, this is my second to last slide, and we'll have some Q&A. In order to teach young people to thrive through social trauma, we have to help them change the narrative, control their narrative. Be Judith Herman, a uh, practitioner or clinical practitioner at Harvard wrote a book called Trauma and Recovery. And in the opening pages of Trauma and Recovery, she says that it is natural for people to want to revisit um, painfully, uh, past painful experiences because revisiting past painful experiences psychologically obviously creates painful experiences in the present moment. It's natural to do that. But um, Daniel Siegel, neurobiologist, pediatrician at UCLA, wrote a book called Healing Trauma. And in the chapter he wrote says that trauma is experienced and re-experienced in the right side of the brain. The right side of the brain is typically the subjective, emotional, visceral side of the brain. And he says that it's totally natural for people to want to find wholeness, wholeness, H-O-L or W-H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S, -S, I believe. Wholeness. And for us to find wholeness, we have to cross that trauma across the billion bundles of nerves that separate the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain called the corpus callosum. And in order to cross that trauma from the left side of, from the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain, we have to construct a narrative about our experiences. And so in his research, he found that uh, mothers who had the most, the strongest bond with their children had what he called coherent narratives. Mothers who had the weaker bonds with their children had incoherent narratives. And sometimes children, as a result of these dominant narratives of dominant society, will, do will internalize dominant narratives and say that I'm not smart because of, because my, the color of my skin isn't reflected in the stories that I'm reading in school. That um, I am supposed to live in poverty. We, as a people, are supposed to live in poverty because the only time pe my people or my community is mentioned in our education or in the media is as second class citizens. But that's an incoherent dominant narrative. For us to have a critical counter narrative, we have to cross those psychological experiences across and, 
And so bring it to the left side of the brain, which is the, which is the objective, rational, and logical side of the brain. And so what happens is we start developing a lateral cognition. If we're able to revisit past painful experiences and develop a critical counter coherent narrative, then we are, have a lateral cognition. And so what happens is when we don't, when we naturally don't revisit past painful experiences, that trauma will thrive with avoidance. Symptoms will show up and too often we will maladaptively cope with that social stress because we are experiencing it viscerally, emotionally, and subjectively. It's not like when we develop a coherent critical counter narrative of these past painful experiences that that past painful experience dissipates. It's that we start having objective, rational, and logical understandings of the subjective, emotional, and visceral. And rather than falling victim to these dominant, incoherent narratives that we've internalized, that guide how we move and decide, make decisions in our life, we have these logical, objective, rational understandings of this subjective, emotional, and visceral, and it allows us to rewrite the ending of those stories and live our life according to the stories that we create for ourselves, for the people we love, and for the social groups that we are a part of. And that is when we develop a sense of control over our life when we rewrite the ending of our story through critical, counter, coherent narratives, we develop a sense of hope. And when we work with others to transform our stories, to rewrite the ending of our collective stories, and we have a, a collective ending, a collective control over our life, that's when we develop critical hope. And that allows us to go from coping, not coping or maladaptively coping, to developing a critical hope. And that goal comes from teaching students to thrive through, not avoid, but thrive through, become bigger people as a result of past pain. So in, in conclusion, um, I cite the work of uh, Joseph Gahn. Um, who uh, is a um, professor at the University of Michigan in um, psychology and Native American studies, who says that the mental health profession that we need a great deal more of the kinds of professional mental health services do, that do not yet exist. And as a teacher, and as a teacher of teachers, um, applying that thinking to the teaching profession, I say that we need a great deal more of the kinds of pedagogies, teaching practices that do not yet exist. That is informed by the health sciences, the social indicators of health, and uh, in order for us to do that, we need to look at the work of Carl Jung, who was a contempor contemporary of Sigmund Freud, and more recently, the work of um, Eduardo Duran, who wrote a book called Healing the Soul Wound, where he cites um, Ed um, Carl Jung, this is Carl Jung's notion of a wounded healer. And what uh, Carl Jung used to argue was that therapists, when um, unwilling to process past pain, to, to heal from past wounds, when serving their clients or their yeah, clients, and for us, our students as teachers, uh, when, when unwilling to heal from past pain, um, will engage in a process of transference right, transference from, from therapist to client or teacher to student, and we will transfer onto our client or student um, a sense of learned helplessness, 
that our inability to, to heal from our wounds uh, will only, will, will limit our ability to teach young people to learn how to heal from their stress or their social traumas. Because um, there's no way we can help people heal from the harms that they've experienced if we haven't healed from the harms and the stresses that we've experienced. And so if, to more effectively teach young people to um, um, transform the way they feel about themselves, the people they love, and their ability to enact change in the world that is imposed on them, we have to first um, be kind to ourselves, heal from our wounds, um, help others so that we can collectively heal together. And in our collective healing, um, use our agency to transform the social conditions that lead to our trauma in the first place. And in the process of doing that personally, we will learn the professional methods necessary for teaching our students to do that for themselves in their life, in their community, and with the people they love. The personal process of healing will help us create the professional methods for serving our young people to learn how to essentially help themselves. And this is just as teachers. Now, obviously, there's an entire profession that we need to encourage young people to disrupt the stigma, stigma for in pursuing mental health professionally. But as classroom teachers, we can help support that work by making our classrooms a space that young people can examine through biology, through math, through science, I mean, science and bio, uh, social studies, literacy, language acquisition, physical education, ways to disrupt the trauma, social trauma, educational trauma that is present for them when they are not as fully engaged in classes. And to do that, we have to teach young people to go from coping, not coping, maladaptively coping to hoping. And that is what I mean when I say we need to teach students to thrive through social trauma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. I see lots of um, hands up. This is our, uh, our virtual reactions. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I wish we were all in person, but very powerful. Thank you. The chat was uh, burning up during your talk. Um, and I have a few questions that have emerged. Um, and I know we've left some time for questions. So we have a few questions related to COVID. Um, obviously, an additional layer of stress and additional layer of stress for probably children that are already impacted by stress. Um, how do we convey love virtually to children that need to be loved? Mm -hmm. um, is that even possible? So what are your thoughts? I know what I know. I don't know what I don't know, but I do know this. Um, that um, I don't teach in a, in a school district anymore, and I've been working with SFUSD to implement uh, an anti-oppressive approach to social and emotional health, um, which we call humanization. But I do teach um, more, uh, I guess, higher achieving um, black students in LA every summer um, in, in a class that's about critical education. And, you know, part of the assignment they, they are given is to essentially tell their critical self-reflection, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, cultural narrative with a social analysis that we call autoethnography. And I had 40 students this past summer, and of, and, and of all the narratives that I heard about the social forces impacting their social experiences the most, not one student mentioned COVID or remote teaching and learning. That for those black students, the most recurring 
socially toxic experiences for them have been anti-blackness and toxic masculinity and heteronormativity. Um, and so I think for so many of those students, remote teaching and learning has actually given them agency to decide when and how they will actually resist the cultural miseducation of their teaching, their teacher's practice. They can check out different, in different ways when remote. So um, I, I think um, that, you know, how to do that remotely, I don't, have, I don't have an answer for that. I think for me, um, in my teaching and how I've been able to do it, with more higher achieving and higher engaged black students from you know South Central, Watts, Compton, um, Altadena, is it was through um, you know for me it was just I, I just taught the way I taught and and you know tried tried to do the best um, with creating assignments that allowed young people to see themselves reflected in the learning um, and to to be present um, with the um, humanity that they bring into classroom space and holding them accountable hold, uh, in a way that they feel loved. Um, uh, I don't, I mean, um, the reality is remote teaching and learning is awful. And it's, um, we just, the best thing we could hope for is growth over time and uh, working on some of the most resistant students one-on-one. Um, -on -one, um, daily or weekly until we you know can reach the uh, larger collective and hope that over time we increase uh engagement um from the collective resistance that we're facing as a result of remote teaching and learning but the same principles uh, apply that we can only be relevant we could be only be transformative and we could only be um radically healing um to the degree that we can remotely and just hope that um, the persistence of doing that will help increase engagement over time. But uh, you know, that's, 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 a, that's a limited answer I can give you as someone who's, you know, yeah. this thing. Thank you. Um, another question related to some specific actions a student, um, a teacher can take to help students dealing with trauma when in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, in addition, I want to say that, uh, sorry, for the, the last thing is that um, part of teaching um, during the pandemic has to require that we create the space for students to name their pain in, in the pandemic. And we have to acknowledge the legitimacy of them being disengaged in a pandemic over remote learning. And um, rather than blaming them for their own disengagement, we have to acknowledge the ways that there's an inequitable distribution of resources that um, you know, some students have to uh, struggle five times harder than other students to access even Wi-Fi, right? And right. You no know, space to 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 learn um, when studying from home. We have to create a space for them to, to for us to dialogue about it, so that the, the the struggle we're not blaming them for their struggle. That we're we're naming the struggle, we're understanding it, and we're you know try to work together to to disrupt that. And I think that's important for them to know that we see them um, making an effort and that uh, we are not on the side of a system that is under resourcing and underserving um, the communities that are uh, under resourced the most. Um, I'm sorry, what was that question? Well, to, uh, I'll follow up with what you said that that includes um, adult students also, especially students that are struggling to balance their childcare responsibilities with their work responsibilities right now. Um, that is heavily falling on women. Mm -hmm. And we also have to call that out as um, inequity. So there's just so much going on um, with uh, people right now um, in this difficult time. Um, I wanted to share a question related to some specific strategies um, that you would suggest, and you just mentioned a few, to engage students who we know um, are going through trauma. So um, you mentioned a few, if you can elaborate on that. Um, 
I mean, one is, is, is I think a lot of us have to do, we have to do some, part of our critical self-reflection has to um, grapple with our own privilege and our own bias. And um, I know a lot of my colleagues who say they're about social justice who uh, we'll get a jolt of discomfort when we name the ways in which women are um, disproportionately burdened with um, <laughs> child care, um, te learning, teaching from home and working from home. And, um, and I think that um, there's one thing to be uncomfortable because anyone with privilege is going to reproduce that privilege as much as we're working to unlearn it and redistribute it. But um, what happens is um, what's important is that we even in our privilege and bias, have to create the space for those who are experiencing those experiences in the multiple social margins that they are experiencing it to articulate their um, frustration um, in ways that they feel heard. Um, but too often, um, you know, like, you know, the profession is in teaching public school profession is 86% white. Um, and then even a lot of times when, the, when, when teachers of color, in order to just graduate from a university, oftentimes have to unlearn or have to learn to hate themselves, right? And I've, I've heard so many students say, the more and more I, ha I, I, I hated being East African, the more successful I became in school, right? The more and more I um, uh, started to speak in uh, a form of English that was different than the English or Spanglish spoken at home, the better I did in school, right? And this could go on and on and on. And so, too, I mean, so if you know, even in San Francisco schools, Oakland schools, that over, there's an over 50% disappearance rate and, and sometimes like less than a 20% university eligibility rate. And that's, that doesn't mean everyone goes to university. And so very few community, uh, you know, people go to, com people, of color from communities of color go to universities. And so when they finally graduate too oftentimes that requires this, right? Deculturalization of, um, in order to assimilate into mainstream society to become successful in society then we return back to schools, not as servants of the communities that we came from or to uh, not as servants of communities that um, experience life like communities that we come from, but too oftentimes as servants of a community that's at odds with the history and dignity of the people that we, um, that raised us. And so we end up in, in, in these schools and our philosophy of education as a result of assimilation has become to teach students how to remove their hat when they walk into a classroom, pull their pants up, um, you know, unlearn the slang that helps you navigate your community. We, we teach them that in order for you to succeed in society, you have to conform just like I did. And then if you conform just like I did, you'll get better grades. And if you get better grades, you can go to college. If you go to college, you can put a down payment. You get a job that allows you to have a credit to, uh, a check to have credit to put a down payment on a car. And then you can sort of ascend into this middle-class lifestyle, right? This means that in order for you to be some, become successful, you have to dis distance yourself from the people you love. And so when we start hearing young people articulate their experience with oppression on their own terms, too often as a result of us having conformed to this system that despises our humanity, we become uncomfortable with young people expressing their truth. Their truth as gender fluid people, their truth as uh, women identifying people, their truth as um, differently um, able, their, uh, their truth as cognitively different people, their, their, their truth as differently raced people, and as an intersecting of all that. When people speak their truth, against those social oppressions. Too often, those of us who graduated from universities to become teachers, who had to conform in order to become successful, silent students, create a curriculum that doesn't allow young people to explore their truth. And as a result of that, they disengage because we start to pay attention to factors in our life that could cause us more stress. It becomes a defense mechanism for us to distance ourselves from the cultural miseducation presented to us as, um, education. And so I think, you know, there's many ways, some of the ways I have done it. Um, I think, so I think what we need to do, one, is the teachers have to study the critical inter intergenerational wisdom 
of the elders and ancestors of the communities that they teach in. Those, those communities aren't absent of wisdom and understanding. Those communities are um, abundant with intergenerational wisdom from grandmothers, from neighbors, from big brothers, from whoever, who, you know, you know, whatever. It could, from the narratives of Asada Shakur, from the narratives of Gloria Anzaldúa, from the narratives of, you know, wh wh whoever, right? Abolitionists, revolutionaries, whatever. And I think they, I think as people who aren't really experts in that type of approach to reading, writing, thinking in the interest of a community we're teaching in, people who have lost that way of, of knowing, they can start increasing their knowledge base. And, and they'll see that the ways in which the elders and the ancestors have articulated their resistance to social oppression is very similar to the ways that students will indict white supremacy, indict homophobia, indict ableism, indict poverty. It's the same thing. And we'll no longer see it as, um, as something that'll keep them in poverty. In fact, when we see that their elders and ancestors have done it to lead um, alternatively successful life, we'll see that that could be the starting place for their future success. I think second, we need to help work, find ways to create culturally caring classroom communities. That students don't care how much their teachers know until they know how much their teachers care. If, if I'm a seventh grader and five out of my last seven teachers had deficit perspectives of the communities I come from, I'm going to come into a classroom with a high level of cultural mistrust projecting onto the teacher in front of me the past painful practices that the five teachers who, who were um, harmful to me practiced on me. I'll assume that you're gonna reproduce that on me right then and there. And knowing that history, I need to do something to mediate that past pain of the students to reconcile our relationship so that they trust me to not reproduce the harm that they have experienced in the past that is leading to their sense of cultural mistrust between me as a teacher and them as students. This means that I have to allow them to articulate their reality on their own terms. I have to create um, act, uh, learning activities. I have to create units that allow them to use their knowledge to transform unjust social conditions in ways that I have to learn to become comfortable in the discomfort of young people telling their truth even if I feel implicated in their critique, it's not always about us. We have to be less egotistical and more ecological by understanding that how young people feel in the classroom in front of us is part of them, bring, is, is because they're bringing their history into their present moment. It's not because of me and who I am as a person and because you hate white supremacy and male supremacy that you're talking about me. I think third, I can stop. But I think third, we have to also learn how to uh, affirm student and community existence, their, commu their student, their community existence and importance. And here's what I mean. And I, and I find myself challenged in this way often, but sometimes I have to um, make notes to communicate love and affirmation to the people in my life. And I have to make a note of that because I have been conditioned and I have internalized and I have reproduced um, a lack of shared vulnerability. And so sometimes I, I, I don't even, we don't, I don't even have that practice of affirmation. And I think, you know, so much of um, feminist epistemology and especially how I'm seeing it in, in social media today of this affirmation of one another is a beautiful thing to learn from. That we have to learn how to affirm the students and the communities that we're teaching in. And if we don't do, if that's not natural to our um, practice or natural to our teaching, then we need to script out affirmations until we have a repertoire of affirmations that we can use 
that are genuine and authentic to affirm people who need that affirmation because there's too much uh, histories of devaluing. And so we need to learn to affirm people who are too often devalued. Um, this requires that we model courage and shared vulnerability. That we can't ask young people to do these assignments, to critically self-reflect on the experiences they've had that made them who they are today, to um, use the, the um, curriculum to name their pain, to name their world in order to change it. Right? We, we need to do that first. We need to model the type of learning we want our students to then exhibit. We need to model the shared vulnerability we want young people to have with us and to have with others. So we have to create these uh, open spaces for student voice and we need to learn to be comfortable in our discomfort. And in those ways we can use academics as a way for students to name their world to change it. Last question. <laughs> uh, Patrick. Yes. In your role at USF, We've had a few questions around preparing teachers. Um, clearly, teachers who come from disproportionately impacted communities have a harder journey um, in their um, goals to become teachers. The teaching, the teacher credentialing process is complicated. Um, there are many opportunities to stop out. Um, in the best of situations, um, it's frustrating. Yeah. So if we do see that <clears throat> we need self-reflective teachers who perhaps represent the students in their classrooms and can um, speak truth to power, um, what do we do about the system that's keeping folks out of teaching um, that causes some breaks in the pathway to teaching? What do we do? Yeah, I think first we need to begin with understanding that, um, you know, we might have different privileges, myself as a uh, male body, cis, gender, male, uh, male identifying person with, you know, an increasingly uh, middle class income without generational wealth, but still middle class income and all these different other um, physical abilities and um, um, cognitive abilities that, priv that, that I have privilege in. And so I tell people all together that it's not simply about whether or not we have privileges. How are we gonna use our privilege, right? We need to, and how, how can we use the positions that we're in to serve the needs of those who have the least? And second, um, it's the social transformation happens where the socially transformative agent is at. And so I do think we need uh, more um, socially transformative teachers from the communities we, that are most under-resourced economically attacked and um, academically underserved. And at, but at the same time, I think we need um, socially transformative education for you know, schools with more economic um, privilege and, and race privilege as well. So, so that way, you know, this transformation is happening you know, all around. But um, I think systemically, we have to start with where we're at. And you know, this person is race evasive. But if you know, I think the model of Stephen Covey's, uh, you know, seven habits of highly effective people, where um, where he talks about increasing our sphere of influence, is is useful. It's important, right? So essentially, he says you start with yourself, right? And he has all these habits that people have to become successful. And you start with yourself, then you can start increasing your sphere of influencing by by impl in, um, impacting those who are most immediate to you, and then that group can impact a larger group and that group could start impacting a larger group. Uh, I can only sort of speak from experience. And so, you know, I, I, I left school 15, got my equivalency, finally, you know, became a teacher at Crenshaw High School. And then um, I used to have homies at Crenshaw High School and they was, these were the people that I, you know, most identified with socially. And so we would go, we'd kick it, we'd go to the games, we'd chill, we'd drink, we'd, you know, kick it, right? You know, just like I would with my other homies. I had my homies behind me, I, we'd just kick it. But they weren't really into the real engaged uh, political work that needed to happen at the school. And so I had to connect with these other people, right? There's one dude named um, Dr. Gord, like the 67-year-old white dude who got his PhD in English and, you know, really kind of a stoic person. And then I had uh, 
uh, and then, then so a, a few others, right? And so I, I was introduced to them because I kept hearing my students name them as, oh, wow, you need to talk to them because they're doing something similar to you. And so we, we went out to happy hour one day and we had a simple question. What, what, what brought you to this social justice work? And what brought you to Crenshaw High School? And we went, it was like five of us, six of us, and we talked about it, each of us. They said, okay, cool. That was a cool happy hour, a payday happy hour. Next payday happy hour, each person is responsible for bringing one to two other like-minded teachers on campus. So now that group of five became a group of 15. And then we decided that at that second, or it might've been a third meeting, you know, where there were like 20 of us. We said that we wanna um, seize power at the school. And so what we're going to do is because the um, faculty or staff elected, uh, staff elections were coming up, we were going to position you for English department chair. We're going to position you as math department chair. We're going to position you as social studies department chair all around. And I said, I don't want to do any of that administrative stuff, but, I'll, but the union is actually entitled to 40% of professional development. So I'll run professional development. I'll run the monthly meetings. I can do that. And so we did that. And so we, we seized a budget committee, right? Now we had control over the money. We had a voice in every space. And we said, okay, and part of our strategy is this. Um, um, part of our strategy is whenever someone with a reactionary problematic ideology says something in a meeting about students, cause it was just, they just ran the meetings. They ran the meetings. One of us, we, we even came up with a name. We called ourselves the Crenshaw Cougar Cadre someone from triple c is going to raise their hand and challenge that problematic perspective and knowing that someone with a problematic perspective is going to then attack the person resisting the problematic perspective we need someone else someone different from um triple c to raise their hand and, and resist that problematic perspective so on and so forth we keep going because we outnumber them because now we're 20 and from then on in the faculty meetings they knew that they couldn't just spit problematic points of view because there's going to be plenty of eyes on that problematic person's point of view. And so they would decrease their problematic. And so like, I, and so I did so many things to shift some cultural and pedagogical practices. Bam. So whatever we seized power on campus to the point where at Crenshaw high school, they started a social justice, small school. So that happy hour evolved into us taking power on campus in all the chair positions and the budget committees and professional development, and then, and then taking power till we had a small school on campus. And now a person who was part of that initial group is the president of the uh, UTLA, the second largest teaching union in the country. And then similarly, if you look at the work of T4SJ, we started an organization, a grassroots organization of uh, teachers of color the sustainability bit has been hard to maintain, but we, we made, uh, we like to think we made some kind of ripple um, in our work with um, others across the country uh, in this space called People's Education Movement. Um, and, and then now at, at USF, I, I, I'm trying to, is much more a socially transformative mission of teacher training. Same, same strategy applied, it was me, I was fighting everybody. Then I started getting the like-minded people. We organized and so we, we, had, we seized the power. We are shaping the narrative. We are shaping the direction of the school of education and the teacher education. And then I've taken all those experiences, worked with people in SFUSD. And because of this um, lecture I did in the 2010 T4SJ or 2011 T4SJ uh, conference, um, people brought me in to meet some SFUSD board members and together we started shaping an equity studies um, policy resolution that is aiming to um, incorporate an anti-oppressive approach to social emotional learning that we call humanization. Humanization as a learning outcome, K through pre-K pre through 12 district wide. You know, whether or not we meet that goal, who knows, but we're gonna work towards achieving that. And all of it starts with one person who works with other people who worked with one person who we became a collective. And then we just sort of try to influence out. And um, I think that in order, and so now we're, we're, we're challenging the CTC. We're saying this TPA, the, the teaching performing assessments is problematic. The CSET is problematic. And so 
policy-wide at the state level, it's being challenged. Rika and, too, Rika too. Rika and all of that. And, and, <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm not involved in that work, but my, my um, colleague, Rick Ayers, my colleague, uh, Ruchi Rangnath, is, is working with um, a consortium of teacher educators throughout the country who's working at the policy level with the CTC to end that. And so, to, but we have a relationship. We're on your side, call upon us when you need us. And I think together we're shifting the discourse. And I'm not necessarily a Marxist, but I really like this concept that when theory grips the masses, it becomes a material force. And so when we shake, and then Huey P. Newton said, um, power is the ability to define phenomenon and make it act in a desired manner. So when we're defining the phenomenon, when we're naming the issues, when we're naming the direction and we're organizing ourselves to fulfill the end of the story that we've created, the impact is not individual, it's collective, it's institutional, institution wide, it's policy driven at the district level, and it could even be policy wide at the state level, hopefully national level. And I think that's how we have a socially transformative approach to getting more uh, multiply marginalized people into um, schools, teaching students who are historically marginalized. So Patrick, we are um, at time and um... I want to say a sincere thank you for your uh, inspiration this morning. Um, the chat's blowing up. Um, lots of um, comments like phenomenal, amazing. Um, people want your speech. So I will talk to you about how we can um, share elements of that offline. Um, thank you for making our Tuesday um, wonderful and hopeful. Um, and thank you all, all of you on this um, keynote Zoom all have a role in bringing up the next uh, generation of teachers and um, supporting your students that you're working with. So um, I'm going to put up the hand, uh, my little hands up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I wish you a great rest of the week and please everyone join other workshops. Um, we're here for you. These are free. Um, we're trying to change the world one conference at a time, so join us. So Patrick, thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here.